welcome to Dr. Agarwal's Grand Rounds. Dr. Agarwal's Grand Rounds started off as a program to educate the in-house team and has now grown into an initiative to impart cutting-edge knowledge in all sub-specialities of ophthalmology to fellow ophthalmologists as well as optometrists across the globe. We have expanded this program through our online presence on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube under the aegis of Dr. Agarwal's Clinical Education Board. This is spearheaded by Dr. Ashwin Agarwal, Director of Clinical Board, chaired by Dr. Karpagam Damodaram and coordinated by a team of senior ophthalmologists like Dr. Manjula Jaikumar. Today's topic is macular surgery, current practice and trends. The speaker will be Dr. Zofia Anil Navruka from Poland. She is one of the top leading ophthalmologists across the globe. Uh, it will be panelled by Dr. Lalit Verma, one of our senior most uh, uh, retina surgeons and uh, Dr. Atul Dawan as well as Dr. Ramiz Hussain. I myself, Dr. Rakesh, will be moderating this uh, event. Coming to Dr. Zofia, she, uh, I'll be just uh, explaining a little bit about her background. Uh, there's uh, too much uh, to be said about her, but I'll just give a brief uh, 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 introduction. She obtained her medical diploma at the Medical University of Lourdes in 2005, habilitated at the Institute of Polish Mother's Health Center in Lourdes in 2012 on the basis of the evaluation of scientific achievements and the publication of new theory of pathogenesis and treatment of incomplete macular hole. She worked as head and professor in the ophthalmology department at the Carol Johnshire Hospital Lords till de December 2017. Currently, she works in Josne Blonia Private Ophthalmology Clinic. She is a member of Polish Ophthalmological Society and the European Vitoretinal Society. She has published her works in various domestic as well as international journals like Clinica Oxner, American Journal of Ophthalmology, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, Asian Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology, and various yeah. others. She received Red Buckler Award from American Vitroretinal Society, among other awards from European Vitroretinal Society, AO, etc. She has over 99 publications and 1,600 citations. Few of her recent publications are an international collaborative evaluation of central serous chorioretinopathy different therapeutic approaches and review of literature, inverted internal limiting membrane flap for full thickness macular hole, fovea morphology after vitrectomy in eyes with full thickness macular hole with coexisting diabetic retinopathy, swept source OCT and swept source OCT angiography before and after vitrectomy with stuffing the optic pit. Welcome ma'am, uh, we are truly honored to have you here. Coming to Dr. Lalit Verma, the, we don't need any introduction. He uh, is uh, well known throughout. He is one of the most uh, senior, most retina surgeons in the country with over 35 plus years of experience. He has worked in All India Institute of Medical Sciences from 1986 to 2003. From 2003, he is working in Center of Sight Institute as a senior consultant. He has over 1,000 publications and uh, 1,140 citations. He has worked extensively towards betterment of ophthalmology education as well as services to the patient through AOS since many years. Currently, he is holding the post of Vice President in AOS. Few of his most recent publications are Essentials of Setting Up a Wet Lab for Ophthalmology Surgical Training in COVID-19 Pandemic, Clinical Efficacy and Safety of Razumab, CISA Study, Intravital clindamycin as a first-line therapy for toxoplasma retin choroiditis, a case series. We welcome you, sir. Now, coming to Dr. Atul Dawan is uh, in Dr. Agawa's eye hospital. He is the chief retina surgeon. He is, uh, he is the head of the department of the, uh, for retina since 2008. And uh, he, uh, his macular hole repair by temporal ILM flap and chromo visco tampo technique has been widely accepted all over uh, because of the innovation or uh, innovative way with which uh, it has been uh, done that uh, even the junior most surgeons can attempt this with uh, much better success. We welcome you, sir. Dr. Ramiz Hussain is one of our uh, again most senior persons is a retina in charge of our Indian Ocean cluster of branches. 
His passion for teaching surgeries to his juniors is uh, unsurpassed. He is involved in community ophthalmology services in various African countries like Madagascar, Zambia and Mozambique. Currently, he is based in Mauritius as one of the leading surgeons in that region. His uh, publication among various others, a novel pre-operative three-dimensional macular hole index to predict pre post-operative anatomical closure and outer layer restoration is uh, widely uh, known. Uh, welcome, sir. Now, I'll uh, be uh, giving over to Dr. Zofia. She'll start her uh, um, talk. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the nice introduction and for inviting me to be here with you. I uh, will now uh, present you. I hope you can see the presentation. Uh, I would like to present you uh, a um, presentation on macular uh, surgery, current practice and trends. Uh, we will focus on uh, vitro macular traction syndrome, lamellar macular hole and full thickness macular hole. I think the question most of us retina surgeons ask us when we see uh, similar images to those in the upper photos is which one would develop to a full thickness macular hole and which kind of vitro macular traction would proceed to a lamellar macular hole. Several years ago, we found that if we see such a triangular elevation of the photoreceptor layer, it is most likely that it is a stage zero or even pre-zero of the full thickness macular hole. So such an image uh, usually finishes as a full thickness macular hole. However, uh, our distinction as lamellar macular holes and full thickness macular holes to be completely different um, ent entities is not completely clear. You can see here images of the same patient uh, visualized through time. It is a full thickness macular hole with clear traction that closed spontaneously and after some months formed an image resembling a kind of a lamellar macular hole. Of course, the father of ophthalmology, uh, Donald Gast, distinguished non-full thickness macular holes into two types, what we all know very good. So Donald Gast stated that a lamellar macular hole is an entity secondary to macular edema um, coming from rupture of the cystoid spaces in the macular edema. On the other hand, Gast stated that um, macular pseudo hole is something idiopathic, is an idiopathic disease, uh, a deformation of the fovea contour. We must remember that he created all his theories uh, many years before uh, the advent of optical coherence tomography. Several years ago, we published a study in which uh, we noted that a uh, an image resembling a macular pseudo hole developed to a lamellar macular hole just five months later. Um, so we noticed that those might be different manifestations of a very similar disease. You can see it even better in the animation, the changes in the optical coherence tomography uh, in this patient through time and the development of a lamellar macular hole. If we look more precisely on the inner uh, aspect of a lamellar macular hole, we can see that it is quite irregular and it depends on the B scan we look at uh, and we can spot different morphological images. Uh, so several years later, uh, we distinguished several anatomical types of non-full thickness macular holes. Uh, a pseudo hole with lamellar ma uh, macular defects, now it's called macular foveoschisis, then macular pseudo holes, um, something we call a paralamellar macular hole, and a lamellar macular hole with visible epiretinal membrane. Just recently, um, there was a novel paper uh, stating that one of those interpretations I showed you in the previous image was called foveoschisis. And of course, we have also uh, epiretinal proliferation, lamellar macular holes, and epiretinal membrane foveoschisis. The sequence of events uh, 
In the occurrence of non-full thickness macular holes, I mean the idiopathic ones, you can see it in the images and in the video, is that first there is vitreal macular traction that exerts on the center of the fovea. Oh, excuse me. It just went too quick. Uh, then uh, we see a limited ILM removal uh, during the traction release. Secondary to the limited ILM removal, we observe epiretinal membrane formation and we must note that with the modern uh, imaging devices, we see epiretinal membranes almost in 100% of cases of idiopathic non-full fitness macular holes. This series of events, you can observe it even better in this animation. You can see how the traction releases, that's the vitreal macular traction, that tears a little piece of the internal limiting membrane. The tearing of this small piece of internal limiting membrane provokes a gliosis and the growth of an epiretinal membrane across the fovea. It shortens the retina and we can see the development of a lamellar macular hole. On the other hand, we have secondary non-full thickness macular holes, which of course uh, we usually do not qualify for surgery uh, due to worse prognosis. Uh, in those uh, issues, we see defects. Uh, we, we see defects of the internal uh, retinal layers due to nourritory defects that lead us uh, to photoreceptor degeneration and secondary to this degeneration of the photoreceptor layer we observe the formation of a non-full thickness macular hole so i would say the modern distinction of non-full thickness macular hole is to idiopathic and secondary to uh, other diseases uh, we must consider that mainly idiopathic epiretinal mem uh, non-full thickness macular holes with epiretinal membranes are good candidates for macular surgery. As I told you before, the epiretinal membranes are much more often observed in idiopathic when compared to secondary non full thickness macular holes. And with modern devices, it's almost uh, observed in every case. Uh, a recently uh, observed uh, type of the epiretinal membrane uh, is epimacular proliferation. And uh, the lamellar macular hole associated epimacular proliferation is a very interesting topic, in my opinion. Um, Hattori and co workers noted that uh, we should qualify for surgery those people with lamellar macular hole associated epimacular proliferation who have lower preoperative visual acuity and the presence of photoreceptor defects. Uh, this lamellar macular hole associated epimacular proliferation is much more often in myopia when compared to emetropic patients. And now I would like to share with you a video. I usually, uh, after core vitrectomy, I usually uh, use membrane blue to stain the ILM. However, in highly myopic eyes, it is not that easy. Uh, to see the internal limiting membrane, the staining is usually worse uh, when compared to uh, emetropic eyes. In the lamellar macular holes, I usually peel the ILM from all the foveal area. However, it is possible to leave an ILM flap on the surface also of the lamellar macular hole. As you can see on the images, a lamellar macular hole associated with big foveoceses um, might be cured with this technique. The usual technique I use in um, lamellar macular holes and in all types of non full thickness macular holes, which are idiopathic, uh, I only do core vitrectomy, tripen blue staining, membrane blue staining. I remove all the epiretinal membranes and all the ILM, but I never perform tamponade in those eyes. And we published several years ago a study stating um, that no stain, uh, that no tamponade is non-inferior in final um, visual results. 
Uh, another topic I would like to cover uh, is the vitreal macular traction syndrome. Um, and a very important aspect is the distinction of focal and broad vitreal macular traction as uh, published by the vitreal macular traction study group. Um, vitreal macular traction syndrome is, in my opinion, still a mystery. We know that about 10% of those cases heal spontaneously but we do not know which are the predisposing factors. At least we don't, don't know all of them. Uh, we are not sure about the best treatment. And of course, there are no data on OCT and geography. And I would like to share them with, with you now. Uh, what we know from previous studies uh, is that eyes with an epiretinal membrane and broad adhesion are less likely to release spontaneity. On the other hand, when we looked at our surgeries, we observed that eyes with wider traction uh, also have uh, worse final visual acuity results when compared to eyes with focal traction. So focal is the best for both spontaneous release and also um, surgical treatment. In the next few slides, I would like to share with you some details on Swebster's OCT and geography in vitro macular traction. We observed 38 eyes of 38 patients, and some of them had no change in OCT, and those were, of course, not treated. In four cases, we noted a spontaneous release of traction, and 14 of them we qualified for two vitrectomy. Uh, first, the observation only group. Uh, in, this, in this group, no parameters changed, but the visual acuity was satisfactory, and the patient denied surgery. Uh, in group two, the most interesting group of the spontaneous release of traction, uh, we noted that visual acuity improved, but the fovea vascular zone and central choroidal thickness remained stable. There were also no changes in vessel density in Swetzer's uh, OCT and geography. Uh, here I would like to share a case with you. This is a progression from vitro macular traction, which resolved spontaneously in some part, but it developed to a lamellar macular hole, and the vision dropped. Uh, group three, those were patients qualified for surgery, and interestingly, we noted that first vision improved, but we noted it decreased in the superficial and deep fovea avascular zone in Swebster's OCT and geography. There were no changes in the vessel density and nor in the central choroidal thickness. Uh, the multiple regression analysis revealed that initial visual acuity of those patients depended on central choroidal and retinal thickness, but the final visual acuity did not depend on any of the analyzed factors. The post hoc analysis we, we performed uh, noted that even if the initial superficial fovea vascular zone was similar between groups, the final superficial fovea vascular zone and the deep fovea vascular zone were lowest in group three, so in the operated group. We noted also some artifacts or maybe um, some areas of hypoperfusion of the choriocapillaries, um, but clearly in the area of the choriocapillaries, we saw some hyporeflective areas uh, that released with the release of traction either spontaneously or after vitrectomy. Uh, interestingly, the stepwise regression analysis told us that we could determine the factors um, which are resp responsible for the uh, resolution of traction in only 66% of cases. That would mean that there is a high uh, percentage of random events, uh, events in vitro macro traction syndrome, and we must study them much more careful. Uh, however, the most important factor is the width of traction, which I presented you at the beginning of this uh, short um, commentary. Uh, so, in a conclusion, uh, superficial and deep fovea vascular zone decreased after vitrectomy with ILM peeling, but did not after spontaneous release of traction. Visual acuity, the final visual acuities were better in eyes uh, with spontaneous release, when compared to vitrectomized eyes, but the improvements were higher in the vitrectomy group. Uh, of course, patients with wider traction and epiretinal membranes were less likely to develop spontaneous release of traction. 
Last but not least, I would like to come to full thickness macular holes. This is the original video of the first introduced in 2010 by our group, uh, inverted ILM peeling technique. Um, as you can see, primarily in 2010, we peeled the ILM from all sides of the fovea and covered it uh, with then, of course, we and others introduced several uh, modifications of the original technique. And the one we use now is the temporal inverted ILM flap technique. In the comparative uh, randomized study, we confirmed it is not inferior to the original one, which was um, dedicated especially for large macular holes and improved not only anatomy, but also function in those uh, cases. Here you can see the technique we use nowadays. Uh, we peel the ILM after, after membrane blue staining only on the, at the temporal side of the fovea in order to save the retina nerve fiber layer. It is not always obligatory to create so big flaps, also smaller flaps uh, work very good. As you can see, we never push the flap inside the macular hole, we only gently cover the fovea with that. You can place also a little bit of viscoelastic material to stabilize the flap on the end of the surgery. Usually I finish the surgery with fluid air exchange, so I never use long-acting gases in macular hole surgery. Uh, when you look at um, Swepsor's OCT and geography photos, you can see that this technique of the temporal ILM uh, flap uh, not only save the saves the retina nerve fiber layers, uh, it also saves the uh, vessels, especially in the deep retina um, um, layer. Uh, here you can see indicated by the arrows the er area where ILM was peeled when compared to the ILM saved area. And you can see how disturbed the vessels are in the areas where ILM was um, previously removed. You can see it even better in this image. Uh, please look at those arrows. Those indicate the situation after vitrectomy in the ILM peeled area. Uh, several authors stated that um, earlier anatomical and functional recovery was reported in the ILM flap technique when compared to complete ILM peeling. And here again, a comparison and a reminder not to stuff the uh, ILM inside the hole because it results in worse function when compared to gently laying over uh, the fovea. What I am very often asked about is the flap closure, something we did not note uh, before the introduction of the inverted ILM flap technique. We made a study uh, analyzing those flap closures, uh, which concluded that uh, bigger holes more often tend to receive this flap closure, at least at the beginning uh, of the healing process. And visual acuity improves, of course, in also in eyes with previously known closure types, as the U-type uh, closure, V-type closure, and others, but also in the, v uh, in the um, flap closure. As you can see, the process starts at the level of the external limiting membrane. First, the eye is closed only, the uh, full thickness macular hole is closed only through the inverted ILM flap. Then the regeneration starts at the level of the external limiting membrane, and then photoreceptor regeneration follows. In conclusion, the flap closure is noted in bigger holes, those which probably would remain open, either elevated open or flat open, where the, uh, when only ILM peeling would be performed. Of course, final visual acuity is worse when we compare those eyes to those closed initially uh, in the U-type, V-type or irregular type, but it is still higher when compared to elevated open or flat open macular holes. I'm also uh, asked quite often about those hyperreflective remnants of the ILM and if they do not proceed to epiretinal membranes. We studied also that and published it several years ago. So even if we see such remnants of the ILM, uh, there are no risk of proliferation to the epiretinal membrane. So as I told you before, the first indication 
to the inverted island flap technique were large, long-standing macular holes. But with time, we and different authors uh, found many other situations in which the inverted island flap technique could be used. Uh, first of them is high myopia. And we can find several papers stating um, that in high myopia, that is probably one of the best techniques to treat full thickness macular holes. You can see an example of such a surgery in this video. Uh, another indication is, uh, another re recent uh, indication is uh, age-related mac uh, macular degeneration. There is very limited li literature on that topic. But we know from before and after the OCT era that the visual results and the closure rates were limited with the uh, island peeling alone. Here you can see an example uh, of vitrectomy performed in an eye with a full thickness macular hole coexisting with soft drusen, so dry age-related macular degeneration. You can see the flap made from the uh, upper part of the fovea and from the temporal side as well. The island is built with membrane blue again, and the results of this study um, are now published as well. We, uh, we achieved anatomical success in almost 90% of eyes, and final visual acuity was surely worse when compared to idiopathic cases. Interestingly, we saw that in some eyes, new uh, developed, but even more interestingly, we noted decrease of drusen in several patients it's in our group. Probably this is due to the phagocytosis uh, of drusen after removal of the posterior chiali. Such rare events were also described by other authors after vitrectomy. We noted one case of geographic atrophy uh, 12 years after successful closure of a macular hole. So this is a very rare but possible event. And we also noted one case of development of the choroidal neovascularization, um, so neovascular AMD, after some, some time of closure. So those patients should be watched very carefully for that event. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'd like to share with you a case of a woman uh, with vitro macular traction and uh, neovascular AMD treated for 10 months with aflibercept. Uh, the woman developed a full thickness macular hole. Uh, it was not an easy decision to treat her with vitrectomy because we were not completely sure how would vitrectomy decrease or if it would decrease the half-time of anti-VHF drugs and she received monthly aflibercept for the last 10 months uh, before uh, the occurrence of um, full fitness macular hole. And this is the surgery of this uh, woman with neovascular AMD and a full thickness macular hole, it looks quite similar to the, um, it is the temporal inverted island flap technique. So we gently cover the fovea uh, with parts of the temporal island. And you can see that we achieved successful closure and uh, uh, we could continue our monthly aflibercept treatment. Visual acuity improved uh, satisfactory in that case. Uh, another rare indication is diabetic maculopathy, which coexists with full thickness macular hole. Uh, even in patients with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, um, we must note that even after many, many months, we can see some photoreceptor defects, and that is much more often when compared to idiopathic cases but still those eyes can be successfully cured with the temporal inverted island flap technique. Um, and also those patients should be watched very carefully uh, even after closure as they can develop macular edema as every other diabetic patient can. Uh, what is interesting for me is the appearance of the full thickness macular hole in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Here the ratio of the minimum and maximum macular hole diameter is, resembles much more myopic cases than idiopathic macular holes. Uh, here you can see an example of surgery performed um, in such a case. As the ILM was removed sometime 
earlier, you can see here the uh, transplantation of the internal limiting membrane taken from the margins of the uh, vascular plates. This is a pedicular, pedicular transplant. But as you can see on the OCT images, it, uh, we achieved successful closure of, in this case. Uh, but the closure process in proliferative diabetic uh, retinopathy is prolonged and sometimes you, can, you must wait uh, patiently for many months until complete closure is achieved. So as a conclusion, I would like to state that the temporal inverted island flap technique um, is not inferior to the original inverted island flap technique. Uh, we should always position ILM very gently on the surface of the uh, full thickness macular hole, not push it inside. And we can treat in this manner not only idiopathic macular holes, but also macular holes coexisting with high myopia, some genetic diseases, AMD, or no, uh, diabetic retinopathy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very nice presentation. Um, even surgical videos were very precise. Uh, we'll uh, um, just uh, go on to a few of the audience questions. Um, one question being um, OCT biomarkers for advising surgery in ERM. What are the uh, things you notice uh, before taking it forward? But do you mean full thickness macular holes? Uh, in epiretinal membrane. In epiretinal membranes, some OCT biomarkers. So um, I did not focus on epiretinal membranes in this presentation, but usually I qualify patients with epiretinal membranes when they are symptomatic. They do not have a, uh, do not have a margin of the visual acuity. So I, I would also qualify a patient with good vision if he or she uh, sees some micropsia, macropsia, uh, or uh, has uh, any uh, defect which I would associate with the presence of the epiretinal membrane. Uh, it is not completely clear, uh, there were some studies on that, if epiretinal proliferation uh, results in better final visual acuity when compared to a, an epiretinal membrane uh, that is rather tractional. Uh, I think uh, the future studies will bring us the answer to this uh, method, but of course, um, it can be also, uh, if we have a lamellar macular hole coexisting with an epiretinal membrane, uh, it can be advised that we uh, perform the inverted island flap technique uh, in these cases. Oh, uh, Lalit, sir? You see, most of, the, most of the epiretinal membranes uh, may not require surgery. In fact, uh, I would not touch an epiletal membrane if the vision is uh, better than 6 by 12 or if the patient is asymptomatic. Most of the times we make the patient aware of the membrane on OCT mm -hmm. rather than patient knowing. So, and epiletal membrane is, you know, very, very common if you do a routine OCT in, if you do a regular OCT in routine patients. So, you will find that uh, approximately 10% or maybe slightly more of patients undergoing routine cateter surgery, they are found to have epiletal membranes. So all ERMs don't require surgery at all. And I agree with Sophia, unless in my vertical follow-up, patient starts complaining either of metamorphopsia. Metamorphopsia to me is more important than either micropsia or macropsia, or it's a disturbing kind of metamorphosis. Occasional metamorphopsia, I will again not touch. Because for me, ultimately, vision is the criteria, which, uh, you know, if patient has, or if a high profile patient has disturbing metamorphopsia, even in the presence of good vision. Okay. Zofia, how much vitrectomy is enough for the macular surgeries? Uh, how, excuse me, I didn't hear you well. Uh, how much vitrectomy is enough for the macular surgeries? Whether you will go for the base dissection or you will go till the equator, how much vitrectomy is enough according to you? Ah, I always do only core vitrectomy. During macular surgery, I do as, um, um, as little vitrectomy as I can. So I try to um, 
uh, to remove the vitreous only up to the arcades. Of course, I perform the posterior vitreous detachment, but I do not, I do never attach the periphery. And uh, what, uh, sir, what about you? No, I would do as much vitreotomy as possible, but obviously I will not uh, go to the, you know, shave mode and do it. But uh, once inside, because nowadays, uh, you see, once inside, do as much as I, I normally have no guts to, you know, do only a, a vitrectomy limited to the arcade. I would actually, you know, at least beyond the vortex vein. It's not, I will not, uh, you know, be like in PVR, we depress, depress and depress. But in such cases, I will not. I will do a core vitrectomy, uh, peel off the hyaloid, and then uh, do a not the matlab, as as diligent base dissection as in PVR, but do more with me than uh, what uh, Sophia was saying. Uh, for, for a new surgeon who's who's going to do the first or the second surgery, answer uh, answer could be till vortex vein at least. Sophia, uh, for a new surgeon uh, who's going to do his first or second surgery. Uh, from which part you are going? Uh, he is going to start the peeling of the ILM from the temporal, from the nasal, or from the superior. Means the first pain should be in which part? So I usually start the peeling at the temporal side, and um, it enables then uh, the natural closure of the uh, hole. Because uh, if we do the temporal inverted ILM flap technique, so then um, we want the hole to be covered with the ILM. Uh, at the end of surgery, when we do fluid air exchange, we position the flute needle at the optic nerve head usually. So the natural flow of the water uh, helps us to close the hole. But also in other cases, if I do, for example, epiretinal membranes on, or other cases where I do not use the temporal inverted flap technique or when I perform complete ILM peeling, I'll, I always start at the temporal side just to save the nerve fiber layers at the nasal side, side of the fovea. Okay, the extension of this question is, uh, everybody knows, means you have completely explained, uh, what cases we have to operate macular hole and how to operate macular hole. Any, any indication when you, are, you will not go for the macular hole surgery? I don't and think so. I think I think all full thickness macular holes can be treated. With lamellar holes, uh, it is more likely, with, uh, as uh, we talked about epiretinal membranes, it depends on the metamorphopsia, on some visual disturbance. But with full thickness macular holes, I think with modern techniques, we can close each macular hole. Full thickness, of course. For me, what I Atul do is, uh, you know, very small macular hole. I don't know how to define very small, but very small macular hole with uh, I have uh, two patients who are in the follow up, very small macular hole, six, six vision. I don't know. They don't complain also. I keep asking. They are in the vertical follow up. Another is, uh, uh, there is traumatic macular hole. So these patients, I may not operate immediately. Although I, I, agree, agree, with Sophia, I agree with Sophia that today, you see recently I operated upon a lady who had who had uh, the base diameter of macular hole which was uh, 2400 microns and uh, with the flap what Sophia was saying and still closed. So today with all this technique what uh, you know uh, all of you do all macular holes are closable that is true but if patient has a very small macular hole and this macular hole which I was telling you is around 100 microns or so so and and the traumatic macular hole i'm certainly cautious yes i agree to sir because uh, uh large traumatic macular holes with atrophic edges the functional outcome is going to be very guarded so those cases i think you, you should reserve for uh, you know i mean leave it and explain the patient and as well as the same the very small very small macular hole without any kind of uh symptoms and it is uh, and very good complaints of follow up, and you know we can always do ski. I have one case, an Indian lady coming to me regularly for the past one year, the same without any change of that uh, small defect. So I have not had my surgery because she is not symptomatic. So I'm just following up, sir. 
ओके टेक अ हाइपोथेटिकल सिचुएशन अ पेशेंट इज कमिंग टू यू जोफिया विद द लेफ्ट आई पीएल नेगेटिव थाइसिस आई एंड द राइट आई इज हैविंग द 660 विजन फ्रॉम द लास्ट 4 5 6 इयर्स whether you will go and operate or you'll just wait and watch uh, but uh, what do i see uh, in the fundus uh, does the patient have uh, a, a the, macular the, hole the patient is having a macular hole in the right eye and the vision is 660 from the last 5 6 years mm-hmm. and the left eye is thysis Le- the left eye is pl negative whether you will go for surgery in the right eye or not uh, so the left eye has no vision yes no, no vision Uh, that is a very difficult question because still there is some risk of retinal detachment in full thickness macular hole. Uh, I would uh, discuss it very carefully with the patient. If the patient is satisfied with uh, with with her vision, um, I would not be very. Um, I would not never force such a patient to macular hole surgery because we now um, we know from some studies that some patient that denied surgery. of full thickness macular holes were also happy with their decision so i think this is a very um, complicated situation and it must be carefully discussed with the patient only if he really wishes the surgery or feels some deterioration of vision in the last months uh, then i would go for that so what about you whether you will go for surgery or just wait and watch me uh, yes yeah okay sir yes sir i will try to convince uh, her for surgery yes uh, the reason being a uh, uh, couple of uh, recent occurrences which uh, like i told you uh, more than 17 years 18 years after you know this large 24 my 2400 this lady still uh, you know improved so uh, 6 by 60 especially if the patient i agree with sophia that uh, you know patient counseling is important what is her expectation so that is very very significant so but uh, uh, considering the safety of surgery considering the uh, you know easiness of procedure today i will try to convince her for surgery okay sir so the, the same question we will take to the other topics if a patient is coming with a level of macular hole and the vision is 6 by 9 or 6 by 12 don't, they will... don't touch i don't touch So for you, so it depends. It depends if the patient is symptomatic or no. So uh, I could always recommend to wait, like one month or two months. Maybe it is a very rare event, but those small uh, macular holes they can close very rarely. So it's still possible. But uh, if uh, usually I think full thickness macular holes uh, very rarely uh, have good vision in the long term. lamellar macular holes yes they can have it but full thickness i do not believe they can last like half a year and have excellent vision i thought at the last you have lamellar macular hole no yeah yeah lamellar macular hole a patient is coming with the 6 9 6 12 1 0 and you are seeing the patient first time in your outpatient department and the patient is having slight patient has come for the glass checkup or slight metamorphopsia or whatsoever slight complaint it's slight I recommend him to come again in half a year. I agree. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree with Sophia. You see, a uh, patient. I I have no business to make the patient symptomatic, make him aware. So I'll tell him on the OCT. Normal OCT looks like this. Your OCT is like this. So you take your glass, go back, and come for follow up. If you develop any disturbing metamorphopsia, or for a regular follow up, also maybe after eight to ten weeks, just come for a re. check ocd and if i find deterioration either in vision or in the size of the hole i will try to convince him for surgery and the third third part of the question is if a patient with the 612 vision of the vmts is coming to you first time and the patient uh, a side the patient is having the focal attachment and b side a uh, broad base and patient is having this little symptom of symptomatic from the last one or two months whether you will go for surgery or you will wait for the spontaneous release of the vitreous base vitreous from the um, foveal region uh, in vitro uh, macular traction i always wait at least one month because we never know what will happen uh, we are we cannot be 100% sure so i usually really wait if after one month i see some improvement if uh, in oct 
uh, then of course I wait longer. Uh, if I see no changes, then I discuss with the patient his symptoms. And again here, here very similar to lamellar macular holes or epineuritinal membranes. In vitro macular traction, uh, concealing is the most important for me. So uh, the bigger symptoms has the patients, the more quick I am with surgery. If there are only very limited symptoms, then I wait. I can wait even um, several years, as you could see in the presentation, uh, if those patients are asymptomatic or if they are not disturbed by their symptoms. I have a, I have a question to Dr. Sophia and uh, Sir. Uh, in the era of inverse flap technique for macular hole, what do you think about the conventional type of the surgery, the, the original surgery where you just peel the ILM and put a tamponade and phase down positioning? Uh, what do you think about it? And what is the cutoff and which index you use to decide which technique to use? Uh, okay, so uh, I, uh, I generally use the temporal inverted flap technique now in every case. I know that okay. we have studies stating that it is better in large holes, in myopic holes, and in those all rare events I talked about. But uh, I see no reason to uh, do complete ILM peeling because I can always proceed to it. If I think uh, I failed with the temporal inverted flap technique, the repeated surgery is also very simple. I can take the flap again or take another pa part of ILM from another part of the uh, fovea. Uh, I must tell you that in the last five years, I did a complete ILM peeling in one case. It was a traumatic macular hole, a young patient, and I couldn't detach the posterior vitros in that uh, case. So I had to peel complete ILM. As I was, it was impossible for me to do it. Uh, I thought it is the right idea because the hole was very small and the patient was quite young. But I must tell you that it was... Um, my only failure in that year of surgery and I had to repeat it with an autologous island transplant as, as surprisingly this very close hole, uh, th this very small hole did not close with uh, island peeling. It's a it is of course a random event and we know that island peeling is successful in uh, smaller macular holes but still um, such as history. Do you, do, you, do you follow any index, I mean like preoperative analysis or CT analysis to see uh, the outcomes? Uh, usually I do temporal ILM flap in all cases now. So first okay. I analyzed that and qualified only um, cases with big, which were bigger, the minimum uh, diameter was bigger than 400 microns. But now I, I do not think about it. All full thickness go temporal flap for me. Okay. Do Sir, you... So for me, all the indices are history. All the indices are into oblivion, and uh, all those complicated, you know, HF hole formation factor and C plus D yeah. upon A. All these are history, and I agree with Sophia. The only thing I look at is is a qualitative OCT. I don't measure actually. I do a qualitative OCT, and and I see height versus the base. That's all. Oh. Height is more than the base then uh, I don't mind peeling or definition. You see, we, we in this country rarely get small macular holes. Most of the macular holes which I operate generally are 600 to 2000 microns. And I, what definition wise, people say 250, less than 250 or 250 to 400. 400 for me is a small macular hole actually. So because we don't get, we don't get, we get very large macular holes. So uh, I agree. Flap has been a game changer since uh, 2015 or 16, and majority, over 90% of my macular surgeries are flap surgeries. What Sophia was saying, and I haven't peeled for last say more than uh, five years. So peeling, a couple of my colleagues do, but uh, but uh, their success rate, I would admit, is similar to what uh, all of us do. So uh, the the world is today divided between peelers and non-peelers, but majority, believe me, uh, have shifted to flap. And the only indication left for peel is when the height is more, much more than the base, meaning there okay. was a slit like hole, a slit like hole. Okay, uh, Zofia, uh, any any time any time you have encounter with the thick posterior vitreous membrane in a case of traditional 
text, tractional uh, uh, VMTS, uh, sorry, vitreous macular traction syndrome, when you are peeling the vitreous from the retina, any time you have encountered that you are not able to peel the, e even beyond the arcade and the, the adhesions are very dense and how, how you have managed that problem? Atul, may I react to the, your first question, which Sophia has already answered, that uh, you know VMT with minimal visual disturbance. Uh, uh, at the outset, I should say VMT surgery is more tricky than macular surgery. More tricky, meaning thereby, same question what you are ask, asking now, that sometimes, if especially the focal VMTs, where the tenting of the this thing is uh, very acute. In such patients, so you see there is always a fear of uh, of iatrogenic macular hole. So what I would do is a foveal sparing PHFP. So you you start uh, you know you put triamcinolone on after corvitectomy, and then start lifting. Because always study the OCT prior to starting a surgery. And uh, I will start uh, from the from the nasal side, and don't pull, don't keep increasing the suction, and and I will do a foveal sparing kind of PHF. I'll cut all around, go all around the uh, fovea and leave a small stump of transylone attached to the tip in such patients. Okay. Uh, so my second question was, uh, uh, have you ever encountered the thick uh, adhesions beyond the arcade in which you have to just cut the, cut the vitreous uh, beyond the arcade and you have to leave the rest of the vitreous? Yes, yes, especially in myopic eyes or, uh, you know, uh, such in, uh, such uh, encounters are not infrequent. So there, uh, whatever you may keep using, including uh, four steps, including suction, including soft tip, uh, multiple, including, uh, you know, uh, the, the Alcon spatula, whatever. So this vitreous, uh, you know, may not come out. You have to wait, wait, wait sometimes do multiple transfer injections and then uh, do it. But I'm not very, you know, fussy about that. I, 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 you know, make it an ego issue that I have to definitely remove beyond arcade also. So like Sophia was saying, limited with that may, may be good enough. So don't keep pulling hyaloid at the cost of creating a complication. Okay. And uh, if during the peeling of the vitreous, Sophia, during the peeling of the vitreous, you have encountered a HST inferior retina. Whether you will go for the and the, the, the two conditions are there in which one there is a simultaneous RD is there. In the second, there is no RD, only the HST is there. So whether you will go with the as a gas or you will go with the oil. It depends on the situation. Of course, if I see only a very small break without retinal detachment and I do a mediate laser and uh, nothing else happens. I still finish with uh, air and uh, or SF6. Um, if I have any doubts about uh, this area, of course, I use silicon oil, even if it was primarily only a macular hole. And uh, uh, what about the uh, case of the macular hole RD? Whether uh, you will go with the PFCL or you will peel the island without the PFCL? In a, case, in a case of a highly myopic macular hole RD is there, you will peel the ILM with the help of the PFCL or without the help of the PFCL? Um, me personally, I never use PFCL. Uh, only, uh, I never use PFCL in the cases of full thickness macular hole, uh, even if it coexists with a small retinal detachment in the center. Of course, if it's a big retinal detachment, and rather a coexisting full thickness macular holes, then I always go for PFCL. Uh, it depends on the initial situation. But uh, if it's a myopic eye, I, I try to peel on the slightly, uh, and the uh, detachment is uh, inside the arcades. I try to peel it on the detached retina. So you? So uh, usage of PFCL in macular surgery is Firstly, uh, as Sophia said, in, when I'm doing ILM graft, that generally has to be done under PFCL. And secondly, uh, if there is associated RD, reg RD with macular hole or macular hole associated RD in myope, I, 
I generally do it uh, under PFCL. And uh, the reason I do it is because you see, it is a detachment involving the macula fovea, and it's already there is a bulla kind of uh, bullus there. So if I use any instrument and pull, so this is going to get further pulled. So I normally flatten it, and under PFCL I create uh, this multi-layered flap. In such patients, I will actually not use a temporal flap. I use a multi-layered flap. Rakesh, uh, online questions are there? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hmm. One more question. In cases of large macular holes, uh, especially for one of those peelers, does massaging help? Uh, maybe. Uh, it uh, can... Um, I will answer like that. Uh, many, many years ago, like in uh, 2007, there was a study by Alpat and co-workers stating that it is a technique for recurrent macular holes. So uh, when the first surgery fails, during the second surgery, we can do massage. In my personal opinion, uh, you must be very skilled, a very skilled surgeon to do massage. Uh, so you do not destroy the retinal pigment epithelium beneath. If you are skilled, it can be very helpful in your hands. Uh, but if you are not skilled enough, you can cause a lot of disaster uh, in the eye making this massage. Uh, you have any tips, ma'am? How to like? How do you go about like uh, any specific way you do it? Uh, you can do it with a soft silicone tip uh, and extremely help, help um, uh, careful. I rather try to avoid massage. So, uh, you see, I normally do, I in, on a public forum, I will not advocate because I agree with Sophia, you have, I will not ask people to, if I have to do it, I will do it myself. Because you have to have be very, very gentle, very, very gentle. And the instrument I use for massage is is a diamond duster, diamond duster, and diamond duster that too generally not fresh. Fresh means uh, you see we here sometimes have a old diamond duster, so I'll use that for massage under very high magnification, and uh, under under a maybe so then that is the only. But I agree in a primary macular surgery, even with a wide base diameter. Generally, we don't do, but only in a suppose early failure, then you go inside, massage it, re, re gas it. So, if you have time, I can show you one small massage. Uh, I think, uh, shall I, Atul? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. So, let me see in case, uh, yeah. So, there was one surgery a uh, couple of months back where. This what uh, what uh, uh, he was asking was a massage. You can carry on with some question. I will. Yeah, this is this is the uh, surgery. So this is a couple of years back only. Is it visible? Yes, sir. So this is just showing that step only. We inject this uh, brilliant BBG dye. And let me carry it forward. So this is, uh, you know, more than a decade back surgery. So we used to always used to insist that this flap, uh, islem flap has to, islem peel has to go across the macular hole, and once uh, you know wide area has been, islem peel has been done here. There was small suspicion of break. So this is the diamond duster uh, you know I am using uh, for. Gently approximating. I hope it is visible. Yes, sir. So very gentle massage, maybe in two or three quad, mother six o'clock, nine o'clock, four o'clock, and uh, twelve o'clock. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a query, uh, uh, Doctor uh, Sophia. Is there any role for prone positioning anymore? 
do you advise any of your cases for a prone positioning after an inverse flap with SF6? And one more question is that, do you do air tamp nod? I mean, is that enough in, in some cases or you always go for a, a gas, short acting or? So I start acting. with the second question. So first of all, I always use air, air only. I never use SF6 in macular hole surgery. And I think it's completely enough. We published all the studies, the inverted flap studies, all of them in myops, in all cases, and we always used only air. So I think it's enough. Uh, so uh, according the uh, prone positioning, I'm not quite sure. I always advise my patients to keep the uh, head low for three to five days. Uh, I'm very strict during the first day and then also strict, but not that much uh, during the next three to five days. I know there are papers who state it is not necessary and there are papers stating that during the first hours the closure process uh, happens but i think um, we cannot afford failures so it's not a very big effort for the patient to keep prone positioning for uh, a couple of days it's only a couple of days for me it's better than repeated surgery even in very few patients okay uh, I have one more question. Um, what's the best way to deal with lamellar hole associated epithelial proliferation uh, with lamellar hole? What did you say? Lamellar macular hole? Uh, lamellar hole associated epithelial proliferation associated with the lamellar macular hole. Epithelial membrane basically. No, uh, he's asking, sir, uh, what is the best way to deal with the atypical type of uh, lamellar macular hole? Typical, we are, we are just removing the ERM and the, and the ILM. What about the atypical, in which whether you will go for the stuffing with the epiretinal membrane or stuffing with the double membrane or with no membrane, means how, how will you tackle that atypical macular hole, uh, atypical LMH? I am not a proponent of stuffing at all because uh, you see, uh, uh, somehow it does not uh, go to my head that uh, you you know you do any instrument people say gently with the back of the instrument or with some diamond dusted or or, or a soft tip or or with the metallic this thing stuffing does is is does always does some harm to the neural retina so my procedure with the even uh, you know atypical lamellar hole would be similar to what i do in, in a routine macular hole sophia Zofia, what about you? Uh, we still have no studies. Uh, so uh, my main technique was a complete epiretinal membrane peeling and complete ILM peeling for a long time. But I saw very nice videos and very nice results of you, Atul, uh, of some patients uh, in which you uh, covered the hole with some inverted um, flap. Uh, in this lamellar hole cases. And I think it might be a very good idea uh, to check whether it is not better to create a small flap of the inverted uh, ILM in this epiretinal membrane proliferation. We need bigger studies, but I saw how the fovea nice regenerates. And I would uh, say uh, there is not a clear answer to that, but of course this inverted flap technique uh, might be a very reasonable tool. That point, I would, that point I would agree that if it's a large irregular lamellar macular hole and I have decided to operate, so I will use a flap and uh, but again as I said I'll just put it there, maybe I'll use uh, uh, what Atul, uh, uh, that chromo visco, so I'll, you know, I'll put one drop of uh, BBG dye into visco and with a 30 gauge this thing, inject a small one or two drops over it, that's it. And as far as positioning is concerned, uh, uh, let it be you know known that don't scare the patients nowadays. For uh, you know, in India specifically, a lot of uh, I get referrals where people have been scared, people who have neck problems or are very obese, who says, "Or so I'll not get it done primarily because I can't position." So I will tell my patients in the immediate post-op period, like like we have wrote it today. So for a couple of one or two hours, he will lie in front of me. And then once he goes home, he is in a reading position. That's it. He's looking that should, because OCT studies have shown that hole starts closing within 24 hours. 
Okay. Uh, something about the traumatic maclohol. Uh, Zofia, how many months you will wait to operate for the traumatic maclohol? A guy of 20 years coming with a ball injury yesterday, traumatic maclohol. How how much will you wait? I would wait like three months. Uh, and look very carefully at the OCTs. Um, here again, if I see there is an improvement um, and a visible uh, deterioration of the size of the uh, macular hole, I would wait even one month uh, longer. But if I see no change for three months, I go for surgery. What about you? Same, absolutely same. Three months. Absolutely same. I am still, you know, even three months, I am scared to operate, especially if there are pigmented disturbances around it or if there is a, so, so, uh, a, a choroidal rupture there. So if there is associated pigmentary degeneration uh, of uh, around the uh, around the hole, I would definitely give a guarded kind of prognosis to this gentleman. Okay. Atul, sir, I have one question for yeah. you. Um, how to prevent deroofing in uh, VMTS if you decide to operate on a VMTS? Sir, sir is there, sir. Sir, we, sir has already explained the answer. Uh, we will start from the optic disc and then we will go circumferentially around the VMTS. Then we will take, so we will do the cutting with a 5000 cut rate and minimum suction. Let take around 100. And slowly and slowly we will go towards the center of the VMTS. And if we are not able to remove it, just leave it. If we can remove it, we will remove it. Don't try to make a hole. Okay, sir. And, uh, do, do you stay in uh, usually in saline or under air? Uh, I pre previously when I was uh, learning phase, I was using the air, but now I am using the saline only. But in some of the cases when uh, ILM doesn't take a stain, then I'll go for the air, under air also. Okay, and, uh, in and okay, uh, one, one more audience question is this, sir. Uh, if it is a combined cataract with a macular hole, uh, you prefer a, a single uh, 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 single surgery, single step surgery, or you would, would like to first uh, remove the cataract, then assess the vision, and then take a call on the macular hole? Or just you uh, decide on the OCT alone. No, no, no. Uh, if, if patient is ready and patient is more than 50, 55 years, then I'll directly go for the phaco hole. If patient is less than 40 years, then we can go only for the hole surgery. Okay. Zofia, what about you? If a patient is coming 50 years with a hole, whether you... It depends, I would say, if there is a cataract, I do both surgeries at once. But if the patient has no cataract, I never do a uh, phaco uh, simultaneously to the macular hole. No. So you? So uh, clear lens, obviously, I will not remove. Uh, it has to have some degree of cataract. Uh, then I would, because I actually, I normally would like to, you know, do combined surgery at one time. Other reason is that I do not want uh, to give the credit to the catheter surgeon. <laughs> because uh, you see, if I operate macular hole and then he goes for catheter surgery, so then uh, he he gets all the credit for 6-6 uh, visit. So normally I agree, uh, Rakesh, uh, if there is a cataract, you can assess some slit lamp on retro illumination that there is a, you know, even as a thin, uh, Posterior subcapsular cataract or the opacity or the uniform opacities are coming in the center. So, we always do a combined say that is always better. But if there's no cataract, like Sophie is saying, there's no role of prophylactic uh, cataract surgery. Okay, so. Yeah, so there, are, there are a lot of patients of macular hole surgery where we have done and cataract may not progress, also. Mm -hmm. That's not 100% that it has to progress. Yeah. If at all, there is his, his power of glasses may change, right? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, we are at the end of the discussion. We don't have any more audience questions. Uh, uh, so, uh, Atul, uh, shall I ask one question to Sophia? If you have 
one last question if you permit rakesh yes sir yes sir yeah. <laughs> yes sir you was there that a patient has a, a epithelial membrane plus macular hole so uh, you try to do only one staining or you first do uh, trepan blue and then do uh, uh, b uh, bbg dye or how do you see if there is an epithelial membrane i usually do a double staining or triple staining just to make sure i removed the ilm i know that from histopathological studies um, in most cases we remove the ilm simultaneously to the epithelial membranes but we can never be sure and i encountered cases when uh, i saw that there are several layers of the epithelial membrane even if it was not observed in the oct and, and what is the role of ocreplasmin in vmt uh, I don't use ocreplasmin. It's an expensive tool, and uh, we do not have clear proofs that it works. I mm. even saw a paper that ocreplasmin may be comparable to just water injection or um, saline injection in the eye. Uh, so I don't propose it to my patients. Mm. I would do it if someone would be very motivated, of course, but uh, not mm. to propose it. Even in motivated, I may not do it because it's the issue of uh, nearly eighty-four hundred US dollars. You see, one injection, one vial of uh, ocreplasmin, a uh, couple of years back, it used to cost forty-two hundred US dollars, and success rate uh, was dismissal. So I agree, it's any injection, any injection. If I give air injection, water injection, that also may induce a PVD in. Uh, in around 20% of patients so ocreplasmin even though we know it leaves the laminin and uh, fragment but it uh, i don't think so should be used and i agree that staining adds precision so therefore i would also do uh, you know two in one or three in one kind of staining stain epithelial membrane with trepan blue and then just to be doubly sure that you know because after removing the epithelial membrane uh, part of uh, ilm also may come out but it's always wiser and advisable that you put the other dye which stains the ilm and then be sure that uh, you know adequate ilm has been taken care of uh, last last question sir uh, what about the epiretinal membrane which forms after the silicon oil is it is the same way to remove it or something else because it is very sticky very hard type of and uh, the top surface is very fluffy type so is yeah, there in fact those are easier to remove those uh, you know they, they are not so sticky to the retinal surface but uh, like today also i removed one of them so my procedure will still be same just to you know to add precision to the surgery and make it safe although you can uh, sometimes do it under the oil also rarely we have done under the oil also but you see there may be some disturbing reflexes coming but it all depends if it's a if it's a you know global kind of this thing uh, you know multiple attachments i generally am a proponent of remove the oil put trepan blue and then remove the epithelial membrane with the help of i normally you know use 25 gauge mbr blade to create a small edge and i would you know keep uh, creating this edge and then last bit i will remove with the eckard forceps and zofia what about you anything special comment of, uh, about the uh, erm form under the oil i i, I never uh, operate under oil so i completely agree i would also remove oil i have somehow the feeling that if there is a thick membrane uh, and oil in the eye uh, that the primary surgeon did not completely uh, well remove the posterior hyaloid and yeah. i always have the feeling that the surgery is somehow incomplete so i would uh, always remove oil complete the surgery and uh, and this thick membrane is not just a normal retinal membrane ramiz you are mute ramiz you are mute sorry sorry i i just wanted to ask uh, the panel that uh, is it is it advisable routinely to peel the ilm for all the proliferative diabetic cases will it prevent uh, post operative this kind of issues so that you know we, we can be sure that you have removed the posterior hyaloid and there won't be any epithelial formation in the future even under the oil or uh, even you know in, in, uh, later in the in the uh, post surgical uh, time 
uh, we published such a study and in fact it stated that it prevents not only from proliferations later on but also from uh, macular edema formation so we compared the eyes in which we liked 10 years ago or 15 years ago peeled the ILM and did not and uh, those were vitreous hemorrhages and uh, retinal detachments in proliferative diabetic retinopathy and in fact we saw if we prophylactically peeled the ILM uh, there were rarer events of uh, detachment and also macular edema. Sir, what about you? You regularly peel? Or? No, no, I don't because it's a case to case basis. By and large, whatever PDRs or TRDs uh, we operate, they are in any case such uh, you know complex patients that uh, majority of them I will not peel. I will not because most of time is spent on other parts of surgery rather than so if it's a clear-cut case yes i would uh, try to you know feel and there are patients where i feel and i agree the 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 macular edema is helped quite a bit but uh, routine pdrs i would not okay sir. rakesh any more questions uh no sir that's it yeah um, one, so one, I, one last thing. One, one last yeah. thing. Sorry, sorry, Dr. <laughs> Sophia. We see that you know all the uh, most of the cases in your, in your nowadays get some amount of improvement in vision. What do you think? What is the reason that, that they are getting you know some improvement in vision? Is it uh, the the restoration of the outer layers, or is it fixation uh, shift, or something else? But uh, you you talk about full thickness macular holes. In which indication? Yes, yes. yes. No, the improvement in vision. You see, the is is already is always, always a regeneration of the outer layers because patients on OCT, if you see, if you follow them up and where there are some gaps or some, you know, uh, uh, not, a com not a smooth line uh, all across. So these patients uh, may not, uh, you know, do, uh, will always have some complaint. But okay. if there's a complete, like Sophia showed very nicely, uh, the ERM regenerating, then the photoreceptor line, the third slide which she showed. So those are the patients who do very, very well. They will recover six, six. Vision. But uh, there could be some patient where this, uh, you know, mechanism is somehow halted or, or whatever. There's some interruption there, or there will be a small, uh, you know, uh, gap there. Then a patient will still have the picture may then mimic some kind of. 40 kind of retinopathy so okay. that picture you may get in some patients so those patients will have some complaint if you do uh, multifocal ERG or, or field testing they will show some uh, scotoma there okay sir thank you so much thank you so much dr sophia thanks thanks okay thanks sir thank you thanks, sir. thanks I, I really enjoyed your talk yes and sir i have heard you before also and uh, it's always, uh, you know, good to listen. Always some learning is there from your talk. Yes. It was not very nice to meet all of you and to um, share this conversation with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, sir. Well, I, uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. It's truly an honor to have Dr. Zofia and Dr. Lalit, sir, to be a part of this discussion. And I thank Atul, sir, and Rami, sir, also to, be, to have participated in, in this discussion. Uh, uh, this is the end of this topic. Uh, for those who, of you who have not uh, uh, attended this topic or completely, I ask you to just uh, follow us on our YouTube and uh, Facebook channel, Dr. Agarwal's Clinical Education page. Even the previous topics will be compiled in the uh, channel. And uh, you can su subscribe the channel also for future updates and upcoming topics. I thank you all. Thank you. Man. Thank you, Rakesh, Atul, Ramiz. It was nice. Uh, you know, meeting all of you. Thank well, you, sir. I must say that Agarwal's are doing a, uh, you know, pioneering job in this education series. And it is, uh, you know, seen uh, by a lot of doctors. And uh, even at Center for Sight, a lot of people regularly see this. Must compliment uh, Ashwin and Amar for the initiative and all of you for the contribution because it's very important because you are contributing quite a bit. Thank you, Atul. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank you, Sophia. Bye. Bye, Ramiz. Bye. Bye, sir. Okay. Bye, sir. Okay.